ladies and gentlemen, we are in Tucson, Arizona. I came for the gems and I stayed for the jewelry and I'm really excited because we actually have a mineral dealer today and I've seen quite a few mineral specimens. I've seen jewelry, loose stones, but it's like midweek for Tucson and I'm fully loaded with Mexican food. It's the best here. Anyways, let's get down to business and unbox the box. Fluorite. Folks, I know a decent amount about gems, but these episodes are just so fascinating and so much fun we have a guest. So I'm gonna open up the gray box, I'm gonna bring my guest in, and he's an expert. So we're just gonna talk about gems and fluorite and, and relax with the black backdrop and white tablecloth. Ready? This looks like something out of the movie Inception. You know what, I already like our guest already. He's laughing at my jokes. No one else in the room is laughing at my jokes, but our guest is. Wow. Okay, so it's purple, very geometric looking. I was not expecting this. I was expecting something a little bit bigger and brighter, but this is far more interesting than I think what I had in mind because you really, really have to stop and think when you look at this and you, you have to realize that this is all natural. I bet no one cut this, they pulled it out of the ground. And I just, I think that's fascinating that mother nature can give us something so perfect. I mean, mother nature I know gave perfect things like my perfect curls. You just like don't realize that that, that perfect color and that perfect cut comes out of the ground. Do you have, you don't have curls, do you? You've got. I, I'm quite curly haired. Curly hair, we're gonna talk about perfect curls. Yeah. Uh, you know, that's something I know that comes from Mother Nature and perfect gems. All right, everyone, say hi to Jordan. Jordan, say hi to YouTube. Hi, YouTube. Is this your first time on YouTube? No, but this is my first time on YouTube for an official video like this. Okay. So that's, that's, that's different. That's excited. Different. Yeah. Okay, so tell me, first of all, a little bit about yourself. Okay. How long you've been in the business well, and fun facts. Well, okay. Well, I guess I'll tell you the story of how I got started. Uh, when I was 12 years old, I was wandering through my grandparents' backyard. Okay. And I jumped over a little river. Okay. And when I jumped over that river, I tripped over a stump. And when I jumped over that stump, I fell on top of a pointy object that stabbed me in the chest. Oh, I no. took that pointy object and, and asked my dad, why did somebody cut this piece of glass like this? Yeah. And he said, it's not a piece of glass. Huh. That's a quartz crystal. Hey. Here is my geological textbook that okay. I had when I was in college. Okay. So I read that one and then four more before I was 14. Oh, how cool. I just became obsessed. It was, it was everything I wanted to do with my life was, was mineralogical. I, I just absolutely loved them. And I started my business when I was 16. Okay. And so I'm 29 now. So I've been selling technically for, for 13 years and I've been collecting for basic math. 13. <laughs> uh, no, I've been selling for 13. Okay. So I've been collecting since I was 12 though. So 17. 17, thank okay. you, basic math, I'm good at that. That's essentially how I got started. And as my business started growing, I actually started out digging for Jackson Crossroads a little bit, uh, Terry Ledford, if you guys are familiar with that at all, that's, that's Georgia's premier locality for amethyst. Some of the highest quality amethyst in the whole world comes Georgia, from, from the, Georgia. The state? Yes, Okay. the state of Georgia. Dark purple is very well known for having like blue flash and red flash and things like that. It's the highest quality amethyst you can get for like facets and things like that for cool. the most part. So tell me a little bit about your business now. Well, my business now, uh, Natural Selection Crystals, has grown into a point where, you know, we specialize in uh, fine specimens and things like that, but we actually really also focus on education and developing the, the, the industry as a whole. We want to do things like start new shows, start new clubs, help de develop education, start media programs, YouTube oh. channels like these and things like that are a big step towards that because we understand that, you know, we're developing into a new generation that doesn't doesn't necessarily have the time to sit down and read articles and things like that anymore. Mm -hmm. And they don't want necessarily have the time to read entire books about mineralogy to get a basic understanding or of a single books. species. They're not going to read four right. books like you did. Right. That's a and, lot. and so, like, you know, having the access, essentially creating more accessibility to people who want to have this just as a hobby. Like, obviously, I can read four books because I devoted my life to this. Mm -hmm. But what if uh, somebody who wants to do this just because it's enjoyable, it's fun? All right. So you are a gem lover, just like I am. Yes. You like mineral specimens. I really love jewelry. Why fluorite today? Because I, I've always thought fluorite was really cool. We talked about how this comes out of the ground. Yes. Pretty much perfect. That's correct. Tell me a little bit more about mineral specimens and why you chose this and why our viewers mm. should not go to another channel right now. Firstly, the reason why I chose fluorite is because fluorite has been one of my favorite species for a long time. Okay. Fluorite can literally be any color. 
and when I say that, I'm not saying like any color that you can, under, like red, blue, green, stuff like that. No, I'm saying like if you took the entire color spectrum and you laid it out, somebody actually did this once, it's actually a book, and you had every perceivable color that the human eye can perceive in that spectrum, fluorite can theoretically do that because of the way that it captures its, its impurities is what colors it. Because fluorite itself, calcium fluoride, is actually colorless. Huh. It has no color whatsoever. So it is... Alachromatic, right? There you go. We'll um, pop something up on the screen. It is basically when a stone is colored by something else that is outside of it. So um, peridot is idiochromatic. Only an idiot would rely on themselves because it's teamwork in this business. So peridot relies on its own chemical composition to give it color. Fluorite is allochromatic, all teamwork. We like teamwork in the business, right? Mm, yeah. Allochromatic gems need others all to help them get their color. So the basic of fluoride is colorless and it needs other things, all elements to help it have color. Yes, that's that an amazing way to describe that. Good job with that. <laughs> Isn't it great? Yeah. Only an idiot would leave like themselves. I like that, I'm gonna use that later. Thanks, um, I appreciate it. All right, so tell me a little bit about this piece. So this piece particularly special, to me at least, because of its locality and how particularly fine the specimen is. Okay, so what? Those, those are the two primary factors that, that make this piece special. Now, I know in gem, well, we'll say gems, fine is, is good color. Yes. Clear crystal. Yes. Good cut. Yeah, and, um, well, if it's cut. If, if it's cut. Yeah, yeah. So we'll say like when you have a gem, you want good color and good crystal. Yes. I'm guessing that the game is a little bit different for mineral specimens. Can you it's talk definitely. a little bit about that? Well, when you're looking at a gemstone, a, a big factor for, for a gemstone is that it needs to have clarity, color, and it needs to be stable. Mm -hmm. So those are those are a lot of the primary factors clarity, when you're observing. color, and stability. Yes. Okay. So it's like a good relationship. Um, I and love all the metaphors on this channel. This is fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Like in this instance, we're not necessarily always looking for those factors. Because for instance, let's take somebody for instance who takes who who collects secondary minerals that are like silver. Those will literally be like native elements or or secondary elements to those things. So they'll look metallic and kind of not necessarily immediately aesthetic to the human eye. They mm -hmm. don't they don't fit the traditional qualifications of what a crystal is. Okay. But really, a crystal is anything that has a, has a redundantly co consistent lattice. So basically, with mm. a crystal lattice. Lattice, it's this. I always like you can correct me if I'm wrong. I like to call it like the same way that like the atoms stack. Yeah, that's a good it's way to describe like, it. Um, yeah. It's kind of like it's a pattern of how the atoms are yeah. stacked. Yeah, and that pattern is consistent, and that pattern is stable. Okay. So these are these are factors that make a crystal a crystal. And so like when you think of like metals and things like that, there's actually like millions and millions of crystals, all really super microscopically tiny and yeah. together, and that's what gives metal its malleability, is because it's it's really stable. It's obscenely mm -hmm. stable. Well, fluorite, not as not much. Not as much. Okay. Fluorite actually cleaves very very easily, which is kind of why we don't necessarily use it for jewelry. Interesting fact about Fluorite, though, people did appreciate it so much, despite its fragility, that one of the most expensive dishware sets ever traded in, in history was actually made out of fluorite. Somebody actually traded, I believe it was half of his kingdom for a, a just a set of, of fluorite dishware. Would you give me your house for this? I would not. Okay, so we are not trading no. homes for I did, fluorite. however, at one point did turn down $60,000 for this piece, so <sighs> there is... It, it, it's it's part of a house. It's a it's a sizable that's a, chunk of a that's house. That's a chunk. Yeah. That's like it's a small house. It's a house in like Idaho. It's a tiny house. Right. So for a specimen to be good, it needs well, it needs to have the stability. It needs to have the primary aspects that make that specimen that species valuable. So okay. with fluorite, like it can be different from species to species, and that's one of the things that makes minerals a little bit more complicated when you're trying to determine what you want to collect and how you want to collect. Fluorite in particular, like when you are looking for a high quality fluorite, the factors that you really probably are seeking is that it's relatively undamaged because okay. they're relatively easy damaged. Okay. It comes from a locality that's desirable. So this is relatively undamaged? Yes, it is. Where's uh, this from? So this one is actually from the Crystal Victory Complex, and this is in Hardin County, Illinois. Oh, that's, and not, that's the Midwest. That's correct. I mean, Illinois West. is actually one of the most famous fluorite loca collection localities of all of the United States, and actually in the entire world. Almost every other country seeks Illinois fluorites because of how diverse the colors, the structures, and the special attributes that the fluorides can sometimes have from, that, from these localities can actually have. It is sought after worldwide. You know, that boggles my mind because I, when I go to Illinois, I go for Chicago-style pizza that right. is sought after 
not worldwide. No. But I think I've been looking for the wrong thing in Illinois. You definitely you know, as have. A, as a gem person, I, I'm a little embarrassed. If you think Illinois and your first thought isn't fluorite, you have not seen enough Illinois fluorite. I think of Lake Michigan. That's, I think of Chicago style pizza. That's highly unfortunate. I think of positive things when I think of places. Color, locale. And form. Aesthetics, form. structure, things like that. Okay, so when I think, when you say aesthetic and structure, I'm thinking like these right here immediately caught my eye. Right, uh, some people might argue with me about this specific way that I'm going to term this, but most people will understand specifically what I'm saying. So if you want to argue it, message me later. <laughs> so this is kind of like growth hillocks on the surface. Okay. They call it also step growth, and people have a lot of ways to like describe steps. it. And essentially what we're seeing here is we're seeing another generation of fluorite. So we see the initial generation was yellow here on the back of the specimen. Maybe we might be able to get a little bit more of detail oh, of where I it like came that. from. Generation. That's a really cool way to say it. That's cool. Yeah. I like that. And we'll actually talk more about that when we open up this box here. Okay. This particular specimen, this particular locality is very famous for having multi-generational fluorides. So basically like if yellow is the first generation, mm -hmm. purple is the second generation, That's and right. then like blue could be the third generation. Right. Which we know for a fact this one has more generations than that for this very purpose and we're going to use this light here to show you. Anytime a fluorite has like really hard or sharp phantoms. Okay, tell me what a phantom is. A phantom is when you see kind of a redundancy in its structure in terms You'll see it as kind of like lines that isolate. You'll probably be able to see oh. it the best in, in this side one here, where these lines, they kind of show the same structure of the external fluoride itself. Oh my gosh, and I so, see exactly so, what you're talking like about. Like in yeah. some instances, these, these phantoms can be caused just by like chemical segregation and things like that. But in most instances, these are actually like multiple generations, or at least that's what's widely agreed upon so, by most people who understand Right fluorides. there, those lines. That's correct. Those are phantom lines. That is right. And that's basically lines that mimic the structure of the stone. That's right. Kind of like striae. Sort of, sort although striae of? are external structures that we can see, okay. and they tend to be like physical surface textures and things like that. In this particular instance, this is actually an, another internal structure of some kind, which they're like, if you were to look at it, maybe under a cross section, you might not even see the, the physical like difference between them, just the color pigment differ, uh, differentiation. Okay, I learn a, a lot on this channel, <laughs> but this is definitely one of the more fascinating pieces because I don't really know a whole lot about mineral collecting. So now I feel like just in a few minutes that we've talked, I feel like if I went out and bought a mineral, I'd be more educated. Well, that's just it. With minerals, the best way to be prepared to buy minerals and to make a mineral collection is to educate yourself. And by because, watching a video like this. And by watching videos like these, because videos like this are how you get that, that confidence and knowing what you're getting because a lot of the value that is attributed to mineral specimens comes from the appreciation of them. Because just like anything in life, its appreciation is only as, like its value is only as much as appreciation you can give it. Wow. Because, you know, life is inevitably itself kind of meaningless and so we only give it its meaning. We, 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 we appreciate things for being beautiful, we appreciate things for being wonderful and amazing and that's the meaning. That is the meaning that we give it. You're right. I, I always have tried to surround myself in life with beauty and I think that's why I went into this business is because I just love beautiful things. You just hold the green button. I also need to learn how to turn off the flashlight. All right, you have another gray box. Yes, so in this gray box, we're actually gonna talk a little bit more about fluoride generations because this guy, Okay, that is wild. Yeah. That looks like it came out from under the sea. <laughs> Are we gonna do Disney references all day? Is that what's gonna happen right now? <laughs> I think so. Okay, I'm gonna be thinking about this now. <laughs> I'm gonna try to pull Lilo and Stitch out of there somewhere. I love, it. I love Lilo and Stitch. I, could, I was gonna do my, my, Stitch, my Stitch voice, but then I feel like I'll lose all my subscribers. Yeah, probably. <laughs> In vocal training, they actually make you do the Stitch voice. Really? Yeah, because autism, you know, they teach you to do to modulate your voice a bit oh, more and stuff cool. like that. Yeah, they, they made me talk like Stitch. It is not something that reduces your social anxiety, I'll tell you that much. Yeah. <laughs> well, hey, I like your Disney references. Um, so okay, yeah. this is absolutely beautiful. It looks like it came out from under the sea. Yep. Wow. So, so this one is probably more traditionally beautiful to how other people perceive minerals. I, I perceive them differently because okay. I'm very engrossed in the science of them. Okay. And I appreciate the science and the form and what happened and the astronomical 
uh, uh, chances of the occurrence of that specimen you know is that part is of the factor. So cool! You, yeah, like you never know that you're going to get the exact same like recipe for right. fluorite, and it's going to look like this. Right. Someone's like, going to find it. Like, what if what if they mined two inches away from that? They never would have seen it. Right. Two centimeters. Away. Exactly. And this is something that that should be deeply considered when you're appreciating the beauty of a mineral specimen. Is that everybody talks about how there's no two snowflakes that look alike, which is not entirely true. They're technically like, but mathematically have to be. But you just won't ever find them in the same place. But regardless, the reason why we say that is because it's a crystalline lattice. Mm -hmm. If circumstances are even slightly different, it completely changes the course of the entire growth because everything in nature will form in the path of least resistance. So in the instance of like snowflakes, it forms very quickly because it's in the air, it's at this specific temperature, it's this specific humidity, there's this much water in the cloud, whatever. And so that's how it forms. In this instance, it's underground. It's the same concept, but it has a certain amount of pressure, has a certain amount of temperature, it has a certain amount of access to these elements and these impurities and so on and so forth. And because these form in hydrothermal veins, they can be so different from one another and still even be in the same pocket together. It's pretty wild. If our viewers want to go out and buy a mineral specimen, look for color, mm -hmm. look for locale, mm -hmm. what else would you recommend they look for? I would say look for the objects that immediately you, you find to yourself to be artistically or aesthetically amazing. Because okay. there's so many minerals, and there's so many mineral species, it's quite literally impossible for a person to collect all of them. However, that's not the point. The, the point is, is finding things that you truly love and appreciate about them. And so, and a very effective way to, to observe this is instead of obsessing and, and thinking about what everybody else is doing, just walk out and, and go to a show and, and go to a website and go to a channel and just look at things and experience them. Take the time to think about it yourself and truly experience that object. And when you do, you'll find over time that you'll start determining what really holds value to you in the mineral community. And then that's when you should be really buying and making your collection. Like many people say that they want to focus, like they want to focus like on a locality. Some people collect only Illinois fluorite because there's thousands upon thousands upon thousands of types, colors, structures, and things like that that come from Illinois. Some people only collect things that come from the Southeast. Some people only collect things that come from Japan. And so you can segregate and, and focus your collection a lot and that helps a lot of people. I'm terrible at that. I have 1,800 specimens in my collection. 700 of them are fluorites. Only 500 of those are Illinois fluorites though. 200 of those are from all other localities across the world. The other, some specimens is different things. I have a suite that's all Italian minerals. I have a suite that's all Sumed minerals. I have a suite that's all thumbnails. What is your inventory system like? I mean, that's gotta be. It's it's big. It's big. It's You've big. gotta be to figure out how to box all that. Wow. Autism helps. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, so we talked about how to collect. Right. We talked about why to collect. Mm -hmm. What else do you want to tell our viewers? So we, we have viewers well, that have been in the industry for a while and some that are just starting out and maybe they want to learn more. Do you have like any advice or words of wisdom from a, a veteran gem hound? Gosh, um, I could probably make about a two year long video Okay. If I did that, I would say probably one of the major factors that I would focus on if you're seriously thinking about getting into collecting and, it, and, and you're, you're moving into that, don't obsess about values. Okay. Don't obsess about, you know, is, is this, does this person's fluorite from Illinois with certain features that I like, is it worth more than this person's fluorite with these features that I like? Go for the piece that you truly appreciate and that truly makes you happy and that you know that five, 10 years down the line, you're gonna pull out of the box again, it's gonna give you the same feeling every single time. Oh, that's so awesome. What kind of spoke to you about this piece? Why did you choose this piece for your collection? And okay. why, like, why haven't you sold this? Both of these, well, why have you kept them? Well, this one technically is for sale. This one is never for sale. Okay. Firstly, Crystal Victory produced very, very, very few specimens. And then on top of that, I carried a vast majority of them uh, along with my friend, Justin. And so this, this mine became very important to me as a locality because it helped jumpstart my business. But on top of that, it shows a amount of geology that I would say is not often found in, in other fluorites in, in, a, in a very unique and very, very well aesthetically structured way that presents itself in a way that no other specimen ever could. Okay, that's cool. But another factor that is considered for here is that it has those multiple generations that you can observe. And mm -hmm. the way that this is related to that is because this specimen is actually a cast 
this specimen would have had another generation underneath of it. And considering the colors and the it's locality, yeah. it was likely a yellow generation, actually. Where is this from? This, this particular piece is from the Denton mine in Illinois. Okay. And this specimen was casted over another fluorite, which we can see here because okay. it's cubic on the inside. What does that mean, casted over? Casted over is because it was, it like, as it was forming, there was another generation, similar to how this one has a generation. Wild. So like this, if this came off, and it recrystallized on the inside, this part would be the cast, or the purple part would be the cast. So in this instance, I'm, I'm kind of holding what would be the, the purple segment wow. of this particular specimen. So that's like the shell of the... Right, that's but this so one broke cool. away during its formation and completely recrystallized, which you can see the crystalline striae on the inside. So you know that it's completely recrystallized. So this specimen actually broke away in the pocket and then completely reformed internally inside of it. And now you want to sell it. Right. Okay, so the crystal's good on this. Oh yeah, it's great. And the color's good on this. Yes, and has amazing phantoms, which is a big factor for Illinois fluorites. Okay, to but have why phantoms. not cut it? Why leave it like this? So you've got good clarity, you've got good color. Why don't cut? Why don't you cut it? Well, this is a question that's asked of me very, very commonly. You probably hate it. I do hate but it. But I'm only I'm but, asking but for the. But this is this is great because now I can answer this question. Hopefully, I'll answer it. Hopefully, thousands of less times because thousands <laughs> of people will see this video. Oh, please. The reason why you don't cut fluorite is a very long list, but the number one reason I would say you don't cut a specimen that is in good condition is because this specimen exists the way that it is. It is unique to itself. It's interesting, yeah. I can take 5,000 fluorites, line them up together, and they're all going to be unique to themselves. But then I could take all those fluorites and cut them the same way. And then they're not unique anymore. Right. But there's, okay, but fluorite's still interesting, and we love fluorite, and we like learning about fluorite, but I, I think you're right, though. The, the specimen, it has kind of intrinsic value. Because it's you, unique, yeah. right. Now, not, not to say that, that cuts can't be unique, but if the specimen is intact, you can't recreate another specimen. No. You can recreate another cut. A million times. N most times. Sometimes you have things where it's like has a special inclusion or a special color, and mm -hmm. clearly you can't recreate that piece. If you're taking like an emerald, and it has perfectly terminated, and it's a dark green crystal, don't cut that. Like, it, it's beautiful the way that it is. You mm -hmm. don't need to destroy it for the sake of greed. I think that's so cool how we all see the industry differently. Mm -hmm. You know, you see a beautiful piece and you say, don't cut it. Someone else may see a beautiful piece and say, cut it. Yeah, because you know, they, they, they look at it and they immediately see the dollar signs. Yeah, and you know, some people, you know, maybe before I was doing this channel, I would look at a, a piece of rough and I'll be like, eh, you know, I want to see that in a piece of jewelry. Right. But a piece of rough is a great thing to cut though. Those pieces of rough, they're already broken down, they're damaged, they have something that's wrong with them as far as being a mineral specimen, mm -hmm. but they're perfect for being some jewelry. They're perfect perfect for being a gemstone. I love this YouTube channel because I learn, not only do I learn so much about my own industry, but I feel like when I talk to other experts and guests, I, I gain a little bit more respect and like I kind of fall back in love with the, the business all over again. I hope that anybody who gets into this industry feels that way anytime they walk into somebody's booth, into somebody's room, and they're interacting with them and they're asking questions. I want everybody to always ask questions. I actually even put that at the end of my statements. Ask questions. Yes. You heard that. Always ask always, questions. Always, always, always. Even, and I don't, I don't know about you, I firmly believe there's no such thing as a dumb question. There is not. There is not a, no such thing as a dumb question. Anytime that you have a question, everybody doesn't know sometime. Mm -hmm. Acting like you don't, like acting like you need to know the answer to everything, that's, that's arrogance, that's ego, that's pride, that gets in the way of learning, that gets in the way of understanding, and that's a hindrance to your ability to expand and grow as a person. Hey, we've gotten, we got real deep, deeper than the fluoride mine <laughs> on this channel today. And that's the best part. Guys, this is why I love coming to Tucson so much. I get to see really beautiful things. I get to meet interesting people. Closer look. Okay, so you picked your favorite piece. Mm -hmm. The growth on yeah. the surface, because we talked a lot about that. Okay. And one of the big things that we like can really appreciate about this specimen is how much color it actually has kind of hidden inside of it. I actually call these fluorites liar fluorites. Those fluorites where, you you know, you look at it and it doesn't necessarily look like it has the best color in the world, but then you put a light behind it and then you can't breathe because you're just so stopped in that moment. Yeah. And you, it's just that that's that's everything you could possibly ever have wanted out of seeing some color somewhere. No, no sky is gonna give you that color. <laughs>
right, I think we've hit everything and more um, than what I was hoping for for this video. We've talked about our passion, our shared passion in the business. We've talked about stones, we talked about collecting and minerals, and we've talked about fantastic examples of fluorite. So I'm gonna say like and subscribe. You don't wanna miss out. Yep. And do you have a favorite emoji, by the way? I mean, sometimes I use the devil emoji, but. <laughs> All right, so there we have it. Everyone, I want you not to send Jordan one devil emoji. I want you to send him two devil emojis because we had two fantastic um, examples of fluorite on the channel. And I really, guys, I ask you to send emojis a lot, but please, please send two devil emojis telling Jordan, thank you so much. Thank you for his expertise and his knowledge. And hopefully that will get you to come back on the channel another year. Sure. What do you think? I think I can. All right, tell everyone to like and subscribe. Like and, and subscribe, well, do it. <laughs> Why aren't you doing it? You've waited too long already. <laughs> He's great, you're great. All right, thank you so much. You're very welcome. You was great, thank you so much. Bye crew.